Thank you for joining us today on Netfile. Welcome to the program. I'm Ayola Kasim. The 26th session of the Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, otherwise known as COP26, originally due to be held in Glasgow, Scotland in November 2020, was delayed by a year because of COVID-19 restrictions and public gatherings. COP26 is due to take place this November. The United Nations says 2021 is a make or break year in the fight against climate change. Many people agree, and the reason is simple. More intense drought, heat waves, rising sea levels, and warming oceans are directly wreaking havoc on people's livelihoods and communities. As climate change worsens, dangerous weather events are becoming more frequent or severe. So what should we expect in Glasgow this November? Our focus today on EDFA, but we start with the state of things at the moment. Do stay with us. Young people living in the Central African Republic, Chad, Nigeria, Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, are the most at risk of the impacts of climate change, threatening their health, education and protection, and exposing them to deadly diseases that, according to a UNICEF report, launched on Friday, the 20th of August. The climate crisis is a child rights crisis. Introducing the Children's Climate Risk Index is the first comprehensive analysis of climate risk from a child's perspective. It ranks countries based on children's exposure to climate and environmental shocks, such as cyclones and heat waves, as well as their vulnerability to those shocks based on their access to essential services. Launched in collaboration with Fridays for Future, the third anniversary of the youth-led global climate strike movement, the report finds approximately 1 billion children, nearly half of the world's 2.2 billion children, live in one of the 33 countries classified as extremely high risk. These children face a deadly combination of exposure to multiple climate and environmental shocks with a high vulnerability due to inadequate essential services such as water and sanitation, health and education. The findings reflect the number of children impacted today, figures likely to get worse as the impacts of climate change accelerate. The subject of climate change is very personal to me. In fact, it's more than a subject. I live climate change. I come from an agriculture-based society. Due to the unpredictability and uncertainty of these weather patterns, we are struggling to, to decide which crops to grow. Some have even resolved to planting small grain crops. However, if the weather continues like this, it could lead to a serious food crisis in my community. A rise of 1.5 degrees Celsius is generally seen as the most that humanity could cope with without suffering widespread economic and social upheaval. But the 1.6 degrees Celsius warming already recorded has been enough to unleash disastrous weather. This year, heat waves killed hundreds in the Pacific Northwest and smashed records around the world. Wildfires fueled by heat and drought are sweeping away entire towns in the United States West, releasing record carbon dioxide emissions from Siberian forests and driving Greeks to flee their homes by ferry. Further warming could mean that in some places, people could die just from going outside. The United Nations panel on climate change told the world on Monday the 9th of August that global warming is dangerously close to being out of control and that humans are to blame. But even to slow climate change, the report says, the world is running out of time. If emissions are slashed in the next decade, average temperatures could still be up 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2040 and possibly 1.6 degrees Celsius by 2060 before stabilizing. This report will serve as a timely new evidence base for negotiators at the COP26 negotiation starting in less than three months. It will be a valuable toolbox for negotiators as they consider the level of ambition at COP26 and together with the rest of the sixth assessment report as they prepare for the global start take. This report 
Climate Change 2021, the physical science base basis expands our knowledge of attribution of climate change, including the human contribution to extreme weather events. And it provides us with an improved understanding of climate change, including warming past, present, and future. First, it tells us that it is indisputable that human activities are causing climate change and making extreme weather events more frequent and severe. Second, it shows that climate change is affecting every region on our planet. And lastly, it explains that strong, rapid, sustained reductions in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions would be required to limit global warming. In less than three months' time, the United Nations COP26 Climate Conference in Glasgow, Scotland, would try to wring much more ambitious climate action out of the nations of the world and the money to go with it. Wealthy nations pledged $100 billion a year by 2020 to help poorer nations, according to an expert report prepared at the request of the United Nations Secretary General. The $100 billion target is not being met. The latest available data for 2018 is $79 billion, even though climate finance is on an upward trajectory. At COP26, we must send a clear signal to get decarbonisation moving faster, keeping that 1.5 degrees within reach. And that's why, as COP26 presidency, we're really focused on driving action now to end coal power, to accelerate the rollout of electric vehicles, to tackle deforestation and to reduce methane emissions, which is one of the most potent greenhouse gases. Analysts say the G7 summit made good progress towards this goal. All members are fully committed to net zero by 2050, with science-based targets in place for 2030. However, we are still a way off where we need to be. 70% of global GDP is now covered by net zero targets. But the remaining 30% are not committed. The other thing that really disturbs me about that report, the IPCC report, is that it leans more towards the towards carbon dioxide or greenhouse gas removal from the atmosphere mm -hmm. uh, rather than stopping the emission of these gases in the first place. So removal only means keep on polluting, but then develop some technologies to take the carbon out of the atmosphere. And we do know that those technologies are, are not going to addressing the symptoms and not the root cause of the problem. Uh, there's no certainty that they would really provide foolproof solutions. For example, uh, whitening clouds to reflect radiation, or as the IPC report says, removing carbon and storing in secure reservoirs. There's no secure reservoir for storing uh, uh, greenhouse gases. Even if you build the most solid structure to capture and store the carbon, anything created by humans would have a lifespan. And if it has a lifespan, it means if we follow that thinking, we are simply committing an intergenerational crime. We are pushing the real impacts to future generations uh, who, who are not here when the problem is being created. Adaptation is a critical element of the Paris Agreement. It has been shown that the race to resilience will build on the successes of the race to net zero to drive commitment. Experts say the real question is whether the world can afford not to invest in climate action. Climate finance underpins, you know, all everything else we're trying to do. So we're working really hard with uh, some of the big donor countries and, of course, the multilateral development banks and others to ensure that finance is there to support adaptation um, and resilience. So. We're doing our best. I think we're making progress. Um, I think Canada and Germany and the UK has, has made extra pledges uh, recently. Um, there's still a little bit of time before COP26 and we've got the UN General mm. Assembly coming up as well. Yeah. So we are, we are trying our best to get that finance to where it's needed most. Communities in all parts of the world are already suffering from the financial effect of climate change be it crop loss due to drought or major damage to infrastructure caused by flooding or other extreme weather. It is also increasingly accepted that climate investments make economic sense. 
The financial and business cases for clean energy are stronger than ever. In the most countries, going solar is now cheaper than building new coal power plants. It's really important to bridge the energy access gap there is, there is here in Nigeria and the rest of Africa. But at the same time, it needs to be ideally clean energy. Um, so we're not polluting the environment. We're not harming um, the planet or the atmosphere. So I think both of those things can be done. And it's not, this isn't a zero sum game. I mean, it's not some sort of binary trade off. Um, the clean energy transition and in, indeed low carbon development represents the you know, greatest growth, growth opportunity of the 21st century. And, um, you know, while some jobs might be lost, for example, in the oil and gas sector, many more jobs would be uh, created in the renewables sector. Um, so, you know, it, let's go for it. Let's uh, let's do as much as we can. But I think we're going to come back round to that climate finance point, aren't yes. we? Again, yes. you know, there is a cost. There is a cost to transitioning. Yes. And uh, I'm, I'm confident that this will be addressed at COP26. And I hope we get, as I said at the beginning of the show, we get that finance to the people and the countries that most need it so that transition can be accelerated. Clean energy investments also drive economic growth with the potential to create 18 million jobs by 2030. And that's including the inevitable fossil fuel job losses. I'm confident COP26 uh, will be successful, quite frankly, there's no choice. It must be successful. I mean, the, 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 the science is unequivocal, as when we've just talked about the IPCC report. I mean, you raise a critical point. All of these issues um, have been discussed quite intensively over the last uh, 12 months in particular. And at COP26, I think you know, one thing worth uh, reiterating is that we're committed to delivering for the most vulnerable and those on the front line of the impacts of climate change, including by responding to their concerns on access to climate finance, adaptation and loss and damage. Now, I think COVID-19 has made the poorest countries more vulnerable still and marginalised groups too, including women and indigenous peoples. They're disproportion disproportionately impacted by climate change. And it's really important we leave no one behind. And at COP26, we want to leave no one behind. Um, the UK has committed 11.6 billion of climate finance between 21, 22 and 25, 26. And included in this is support for programmes such as the Risk Informed Early Action Partnership and the Adaptation Action Coalition. The annual $100 billion commitment is a floor and not a ceiling for climate finance, according to the United Nations. We can't undo the mistakes of the past, but this generation of political and business leaders, this generation of conscious citizens can make things right. This generation can make the systemic changes that will stop the planet warming, help everyone adapt to the new conditions and create a world of peace, prosperity and equity. Climate change is here now, but we, are also here now. And if we don't act, who will? The United Nations Environment Programme estimates that adaptation costs alone faced by just developing countries will be in a range of $140 billion to $300 billion per year by 2030 and $2080 billion to $500 billion annually by 2050. But the benefit of the investment will be far greater Shifting to a green economy could yield a direct economic gain of $26 trillion through 2030, compared with business as usual. The United Kingdom will host the 26th United Nations Climate Change Conference of the Parties at the Scottish Event Campus in Glasgow from the 31st of October to the 12th of November 2021. The Climate Talks will bring together heads of state, climate experts and campaigners to agree coordinated action to tackle climate change. 
At COP26 presidency, the UK says it is committed to working with all countries and joining forces with civil society, companies and people on the front line of climate change to inspire action ahead of COP26. But activists still see roadblocks. Uh, would just be another space for conversations between policymakers and negotiators. The Paris Agreement cannot deliver on the climate action that we need. The entire package will not deliver. Number one, because it's not addressing emissions at source, is depending on voluntary action by nations, so that nations who don't have emissions, who have not created the problem, are the ones who are more ambitious. So even if those nations who did not create the problem, who don't create the, who don't pump greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, if they cut emissions they didn't create and cut more, it will make a dent on the problem if the big polluters keep on polluting. And then we hear a lot about net zero. Everybody's going to say, we're going to achieve net zero economic uh, growth or emissions, emission reduction. That means the plan is to keep on polluting and then take out some actions somewhere, like carbon capture and storage, some kind of geoengineering actions or, or buy up trees in Gabon or in Nigeria and say, this is capturing the carbon that we're polluting. So net zero is big fiction. It doesn't mean zero emissions. And it's not going to solve the problem. It's just a way of making people feel good about the environmental crimes they are committing. And so we need to actually go down to that, examining the concepts being dri driving and being driven by these negotiations. If those concepts are negative, solutions will not be positive. At the Climate and Development Ministerial, convened by the UK COP26 presidency on the 31st of March 2021, participants recognized the urge to streamline access to climate finance, with greater individual and collective action required both before and following COP26. The Tax Force on Access to Climate Finance was announced in response to calls for coherent and effective support for developing countries' efforts to decarbonize their economies, adapt to climate change, and establish green growth pathways. Nationally determined contributions are basically um, are a sort of action plan for countries to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but also these days also to adapt to the climate change impacts that you know, are now already happening. A large number of NDCs were submitted just prior to and after the UN deadline of 30 July. And I'm, I'm delighted that Nigeria was among those to submit a comprehensive and ambitious NDC with an enhanced target to reduce um, emissions, conditional and external support. Um, I think it, it, it's quite easy to be doom and gloom. I think some significant progress has been made since Paris. And COP26 will see major increases in ambition, both through national level commitments and real economy changes. More is, needs to be done, of course, and we are using our presidency to ensure the Paris Agreement is put back on track. Climate change is a global issue, and the COP process, I think, is the best way to bring together all parties to tackle it. Under the leadership of the UK, the G7, nations have now have 2030 emissions reduction targets aligned with net zero by 2050 and around 70 percent of the world economy is also now covered by net zero targets which is up from less than 30 percent from when the uk took on the cop 26 presidency um, about a year ago at the g7 leaders summit in cornwall uk prime minister boris johnson launched the blue planet fund this £500 million fund aims to support developing countries to protect the marine environment and reduce poverty and seeks outcomes in biodiversity, climate change, marine pollution and sustainable seafood. Specifically, the fund aims to improve marine biodiversity and support livelihoods by protecting and enhancing marine ecosystems, improve resilience, adaptation to and mitigation of climate change, reduce marine pollution through action on land-based and sea-based sources and ensure that seafood is produced and distributed in ways which support healthy ecosystems. Global Plastic Action Partnership is one of the current programs which is being supported by the UK through the Blue Planet Fund. Nigeria is a beneficiary. So we are putting in some funding. We're putting in some uh, two and a half million pounds this financial year. 
Um, that's for four, possibly a fifth country. Uh, but I hope Nigeria takes this opportunity, uh, uses this um, funding to good effect here. Um, I'm delighted that um, uh, the uh, Ministry of Environment has just uh, set up or recently set up a sort of circular economy uh, group. And it's not just public officials, but that in will include the private sector and also CSOs. So it really is an inclusive approach to tackling the scourge, mm -hmm. oh, the scourge of plastic waste. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty certain it's going to be successful. At the heart of COP26 will be negotiations involving the 197 parties to the UN Convention on Climate Change. The UK aims to bring countries together to agree a comprehensive, ambitious and balanced outcome that takes forward coordinated climate action and resolves key issues related to the UNFCCC, the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement. We must treat climate change as an immediate threat, just as we must treat the connected crisis of nature and biodiversity loss and pollution and waste as immediate threats. As recently noted in the IPCC and the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, IPES, the twin to IPCC, if you like, under the CBD convention, um, we understand that climate change exacerbates already grave risks to biodiversity and natural managed habitats. Ecosystem degradation damages nature's ability to reduce the force of climate change. And as the IPCC Working Group 1 report reminds us, reducing greenhouse gases will not only slow climate change, but will improve air quality. It's all connected. It's time to get serious because every ton of CO2 emission adds to global warming. Governments need to make their net zero plan an integral part of their Paris commitments. They must finance and support developing countries to adapt to climate change, as promised under the Paris Agreement. They must decarbonize faster. They must restore natural systems that draw down carbon, cut out methane, and other greenhouse gases faster. Get behind the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol to cut the climate impact of the cooling industry. And every business, every investor, and every citizen needs to play their part. Paris set the destination, limiting warming well below 2 degrees, aiming for 1.5 degrees. The negotiation issues include finalizing the Paris Rule Book the rules needed to implement the 2015 Paris Agreement and conclude outstanding issues from COP25 in Madrid. They will also seek to deliver on all essential negotiating items for 2020 and 2021. The direction of travel is known. You have to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions that come from energy primarily, but also from land use and forestry and from industrial activities. That's pretty clear. We know what we have to do. But we are increasingly also able to point to ways you can deliver those outcomes at relatively marginal costs. And certainly, if you look at the damages from climate and weigh those against the costs of action, the costs of actions are quite modest. The damages are very, very large. So in net, in balance, the world is much, much better served by taking these actions. As the world looks forward to COP26, one thing is clear. Its success hinges on the wealthy world's ability to foster solidarity, fairness and prosperity with poor countries which have been battered by the climate crisis, COVID-19 and mounting debt. The COP26 summit in Glasgow comes at a time of maximum need, as well as maximum opportunity to deliver on the Paris Agreement's promise of a fair, equitable and robust response to climate change. COP26 will centre on delivering goals set out in the 2015 Paris Agreement, which aims to limit global warming to between 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius, as well as moving the United Nations climate change process forward. Analysts say the conference will be used to both address what has and hasn't been achieved since 2015, while also setting concrete plans to reach the Paris Agreement's targets. We're keeping watch and we'll give you updates. That's our programme for the week. Thank you for watching. From all of us here in Lagos, it's bye for now.